uh, session that will run us right up until <coughs> noon when we'll take an hour break for lunch. We're going to start out with Sally Stein, who is going to talk about the citizen science effort here at Cork Street Thank you, Sean. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. Um, my name is Sally, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at Cork Street Swamp Sanctuary. Um, I've been here for 14 years, um, and I've been involved in everything from volunteer training to prescribed fire to uh, monitoring wildlife and all kinds of things. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you today is um, some of the citizen science programs that we have um, that we're organizing here from Cork Street, um, on site and in the surrounding area. Um, citizen science, as many of you probably are aware, is um, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's basically the systematic collection of data, primarily on a volunteer basis, um, that oftentimes um, organizations really don't have the funds to do. A lot of these citizen science programs, the great information we're getting from them um, couldn't possibly be done without people volunteering to do them. So, um, so citizen science is a very important um, um, tool that we have in our, in our research um, in various areas. So we have, um, at Cork Street, we have um, several different programs that we do um, that involve both our staff and our, our volunteers here at Cork Street and some of the public as well, public volunteers. We're always looking for more volunteers to help with <coughs> So the things we're going to talk about today are the ones that we uh, focus on here at Cork Street. Uh, we do have the Audubon Christmas Bird Count. That's one of four different bird counts done in the area. <laughs> Um, in Collier County. There's also several in Lee County and Hedry County and all through, actually all through the Americas, South America and up to Canada. Um, there's a lot of different bird, um, the Christmas bird counts that go on and I'll talk a little bit more about those in detail. But um, we do have our, um, our Christmas bird count circle which is the Cork Street Christmas bird count circle. Um, also here we do our, our monthly bird surveys. These were, um, began uh, quite a while ago. Uh, where we actually survey different sections of the sanctuary um, on transects to um, determine what our, how our bird populations are doing. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, we also have, have had our, um, <coughs> our summer butterfly surveys um, that we've, we've done for probably 18 years now. Um, and they are, they're the only insect survey that we do, and butterflies are really important pollinators, and they're tied to specific plants. Um, a lot of them have to have a certain kind of plant to lay their eggs on that the young they've evolved with to be able to um, survive and, and go forward. So by keeping an eye on the populations of these um, butterflies, we can see what our habitats are doing. Um, also our boardwalk naturalists, our volunteers that are out on the boardwalk every day. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold, I'm trying to get over <laughs> Um they're out there recording our wildlife sightings and all the various habitats that we have along the boardwalk. And that includes things like birds and mammals and butterflies and all kinds of things. And um, that data is very important um, to collect because as you've seen in, in the Everglades region with um, some of the small mammal declines and things like that, um, the, the information we have from many years of data from that um, could be potentially um, very um, important in the future as far as figuring out what's going on in the environment with some of these invasive species that are um, showing up and taking over. Um, also, as Mike Duber mentioned earlier, we do have the two water gauges out on the boardwalk uh, that our volunteers on the boardwalk um, are very diligent about recording the data every, every day of the year, whenever there is water out there, <laughs> to keep track of, of the water levels. And those, those things are really important as well, as Mike mentioned. So the Christmas bird count, if you don't know what it is, um, Christmas bird count is um, the longest running citizen science program in the whole um, world. Um, it began back in 1900, and, um, and it's basically an early winter season count. It's um, done kind of right in the beginning, or kind of middle of migration. Maybe not all things have moved down south in their migratory routes yet. But, um, but basically, it kind of gives a snapshot of where the birds are and because so many people are, are doing the surveys, it gives you a really good picture of the numbers of birds and, and how they're doing as well. And how, when they're moving around and sometimes how the weather is affecting when they move. 
Um, it gives you also an idea of the winter range of some, some of the species of birds as well. So, um, so like I mentioned before, um, the Christmas bird counts were done all through the Americas. Um, it was started here in North America, in, in the United States, however. But, um, but basically, um, the data collected by the um, people who do the Christmas bird count survey, survey of the last 115 years um, allow researchers, Audubon researchers, and um, nonprofits, and wildlife agencies, and pretty much anyone who has an interest in figuring out what's going on with bird populations. Um, this is a wonderful database um, that they can use. Um, and actually, information from this has been used in the State of the Birds report. That's a collaborative um, effort that's done every year. Um, and, and other things we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but basically, on each count, um, the, the counters go out um, in a specified area. Um, like I mentioned, here in Collier County, we have four count circles. Um, and the, each of these circles are 15 <coughs> miles in diameter. So the one here at Cork Street uh, covers the whole sanctuary, parts of Panther Island up in the northwest, um, Immokalee, parts of Immokalee, parts of Golden Gate Estates. So it covers a wide range of habitats and, and situations with both um, residential, some urban, um, the Lake Trafford is, is in the count circle as well. So a wide range. So we actually <coughs> um, have people that spread out all over um, county and up to um, 10 different areas. And in those 10 areas, sometimes we have um, several different teams um, covering those areas. So there's a lot of roads and things that they take a lot of time to travel. <laughs> So, um, so we've heard all the, the birds that we can identify by either sight or sound, and, um, and we can see what's going on in our area um, from that, but also it's used on a, a national and international basis for, for studying birds. <coughs> so um, just some pictures of some of the volunteers helping bird helps. Um, but basically, um, the, the long, status of collecting this data has been uh, really instrumental in, in figuring out what's going on with birds over the past century. And there's some examples of things that um, <coughs> utilize Christmas bird count data. Um, the state of the birds report, like I mentioned, um, is one on um, figuring out basically that there's been a, a huge decline in some of the species over the past 40 years for various reasons. And by figuring this out, we might be able to figure out why that is. In a lot of cases, we have really hope for, hope for trying to restore some of the habitat and, and protect some of these species and, and try to keep them from getting endangered or extinct. <coughs> and just this past year, um, we just, Audubon, National Audubon just put out um, this groundbreaking report on birds and climate and basically how climate change could affect um, over half the bird species uh, detrimentally as far as habitat range um, um, in the coming 80 years with climate change going on. And you never know what what some of this data might be used for in the future, but it's definitely um, an important important um, work that, that's being done to um, collect the data that is going to, to um, be useful for future research. So here's our count circle, you can see in the map. Uh, there's like traffic, the parts of the crew marsh, and all the groups respond parts of Golden Gate Estates, and the Immokalee area is right here. Um, we've been doing here, of course, to the Christmas bird count for 37 years total. Um, for some reason, <laughs> we we didn't do them, apparently, in the count circle um, in the after 1960 for a while. But from 1981 till the present, um, we've been doing them every year. And this past year, we had 57 participants. Um, we divided up the 15 teams to cover the area. Um, and, um, and we actually recorded this year 119 species of birds, which is pretty average. Um, our numbers were a little bit higher than last year. We had um, about 31,000 individual birds. Um, most of that was due to tree swallows. <laughs> we had a lot more tree swallows. <laughs> um, the other numbers pretty much stayed pretty average. Um, and we actually had high counts of several different species this year, um, including um, some of the birds that are considered imperiled, something um, 
some of them, um, including the purple yellow, we had a high count, the highest count we've ever had in our circle. That doesn't mean that birds doing well everywhere, but in our circle it's doing okay. <laughs> uh, Black-bellied whistling ducks, which have been also increasing in number in the area, um, also we had a high count. Um, but we had ten different species that we had. We had well nine different species that were high counts, and one new species that we never had in our count circle before. It's a very common bird. Southwest Florida, the brown pelican. So, <laughs> that's not a usual bird that we get out in this area. But anyway, um, so we have 119 species. Um, also, when you're when you're doing a Christmas bird count, um, they let they let you record on your data sheet three days before and after the count any birds that didn't show up or weren't found on the day of the count, and that kind of just gives it gives people an idea. So that they're in the area, um, but it doesn't really count. We had three species that we didn't have show up on the day of the count. Um, one of them was the oven bird, um, which <coughs> kind of sporadic as far as whether or not you find it or not. Um, and also the wood duck and the hairy woodpecker, which isn't a, a very common bird to see. Anymore, but um, but that was, that's always interesting to see what's going on with the birds. And it varies from year to year depending on um, the conditions, especially for wading birds and the water levels and how, if they're breeding well in the area. Um, but it, it kind of goes back and forth. You can actually go online and look up our specific count circle. And if you're interested in a specific species, you can actually go to the, um, the um, Christmas bird count website and type in our, our count circle code, which is FL, standing for Florida, and then the letter CS and you can actually look up um, certain species. So here, here's just an example. Um, you can choose the range. You can look back 20 years. I didn't do that because it wouldn't fit on the screen. But um, <laughs> this goes back about 10 years. And um, you can see how the numbers of anhingids have changed. And here in the, the bottom of the chart that they pull up, they tell you the year of the count um, <clears throat> and actually um, the number of birds per party hour. Um, and, and the actual number of birds that you saw. And that's what the chart is, per party hour. And each of the parties are out there for varying amounts of time. And that's really important to record that, right? Because um, that gives an idea of kind of the relative abundance of birds. Um, so if you just have one observer um, out there for, for two hours versus three for two hours, it still counts as the same party time, even though you have four observers. Um, but anyway, you can see how anhingids kind of bump around there. We had a kind of average year for anhingids, at least in the, the, the near, the, the most recent years anyway. <clears throat> um, also, I mentioned we do mon monthly bird surveys here at Corpus Drew also. Um, this began in 1992. Um, it was set up by Ted Ballou, an aided ornithologist in the area. He was our Corpus Drew biologist back then. And, um, and this has been a, a long-term volunteer um, project. It's our course through volunteers that work on, on this project. Um, we keep the data in Excel worksheets. It's also submitted to eBird, which is another online database for birds that researchers can use for, um, for uh, different data sources for research. Um, the teams um, each have a volunteer leader, two of which, um, David Weeks, who works for the, the county, and um, Guy Fisher have been involved in the project since the beginning. Um, so it's really good to have um, people who have a history with it for the whole time. And they cover four different transects through the property. Um, one is the Boardwalk, Boardwalk Center parking lot area, um, the Central Marsh, which Mike was talking about earlier, the um, part of their transect goes out on the Central Mar Marsh transect. Um, the South Dyke, which goes down into what's now Bird Rookery Swamp on the Crew property, um, which is a be beautiful place if you haven't been there yet. It's a really neat place to get. Um, but that part of the property used to be on Crook Street land. Um, so we still continue the bird surveys there, even though we did a land swap about six years ago um, to, to keep up with um, what's going on in that area as well. And then Washout Road, which is up at the northern end of, of the sanctuary, um, it pretty much covers everything north of the visitor center. And here's just an idea. Um, we ought to record not only how many birds we see and the type of bird, but also what habitat that they're seen in. 
Um, so here you can see the central marsh uh, transect area. And they don't actually go all the way out on the tran transect, but they go in a little ways on. <laughs> Depending on water levels, probably. But <clears throat> but just an idea. Um, we do submit this information to eBird. And um, this is our eBird um, site. You can actually see we've submitted over 15,000 checklists. Because we've gone back and and entered data from from years before they even developed this website. Um, we've had volunteers who've done that. Um, one of them probably is here in this room, Sharon Stillwell. <laughs> um, she's really um, done most of the work as far as entering and making sure the data is correct on the eBird site. And um, Art Blatt is our volunteer as well. He's in here in the day. Um, Art Blatt is our compiler for our monthly <coughs> Um, another survey that we do is the butterfly survey. Um, we do, we've been doing this for um, several years. It began in 19, oh, sorry, 1994. Um, we usually don't have enough people in the summer to really cover our whole count circle, which is as big as the Cork Street Christmas Bird count, count Circle. So we really just focus our effort right during the sanctuary. Um, and so we have usually four to five teams that go out in the sanctuary <coughs> to survey the butterfly population. Um, we do submit this information to the North American Butterfly Association, who is the organization that really is studying butterflies and what their populations are doing and what's going on with butterflies. Um, but it also gives us an idea of what plants are around and, and if we're managing the habitat correctly. Um, last year we had um, 43 species of butterflies. When I first started doing the butterfly stories, I had no idea we had that many butterflies. <laughs> so that was. Um, and again, our boardwalk naturalists who are out there every day uh, record the water levels um, on the gauges along the boardwalk, which is very useful for um, especially things like wading birds, and, um, but other things as well. Um, and one of the things we determined, uh, Jason actually determined um, through his woodstork research, is using that information uh, that, that basically the woodstorks only nest in years of above average rainfall and above average water levels for extended periods of time, many of the years, at least in the last 20 to 30 years, that the woodstorks have been um, kind of timing their nesting to, which is a change from what they did in the past. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> so that's kind of just an overview. Uh, we also have, um, these are our checklists that we use on the boardwalk. Um, of all the, the potential speed, well, not all of them, we have room for right in birds, but the ones that we see the most often, um, we also keep track of butterflies and mammals, reptiles, and amphibians that are seen out there. Um, and then volunteers record what habitat that they, that they are seen as well. Um, this is just um, a chart that Sean actually made, um, showing our average water depth, water depth in the lettuce lakes um, over the course of uh, a year, pretty much. Um, that's the average. And this was, I think, 2013. Um, as the summer was approaching, that was a, a good year. We had a lot of uh, rainfall that year. Um, and the storks nested the next year. So that was, that was pretty nice. um, and a lot of the information we use for general information too for our visitors as far as what what they're likely to see um, at certain times of year as well. <laughs> <laughs>
Have you taken your Christmas bird count data or any of the other bird counts and done any type of trend analysis? I'm thinking, you know, things are on the watch list now with things like painted bunnies and things like that. Right. Have you ever done that just for for folks group? Um, we have done that in the past with our uh, monthly bird count surveys. Um, not necessarily with the Christmas bird count, but um, but some, like I mentioned, some of the things that are on the watch list now, like the painted bunting, we had our highest count ever of those birds this year. So, it, I mean, we can kind of see what's going on with that, but you really get more information from the monthly, the monthly bird surveys, at least what's going on right here. Just kind of follow up, Kim, and, and Sean, I wasn't sure that at the end of the day we're thinking about what next, but as you were talking, I'm thinking, all the times where I have students come in for senior projects and they're saying, what could I do? Or the times when I'm, we're teaching at either the undergraduate or graduate level data analysis, it seems like we, we could be using these data sets to do what Kim was saying. Teaching these concepts of trend analysis with real data that might give you something back. So we should talk about it. Yeah, and we really haven't had dedicated staff to really be able to put much energy into those analysis. Well, hopefully in the next a year or two we'll have more time to be able to dig into those data more. And the win I think that's a perfect solution for at least starting off that process.